is to me anyhow. I'm really encouraged as I've been studying. So we'll hand out our sheet for this week. Um, if you'd like a sheet, ushers, if you'll come around and pass. Today we're going to continue. We're still in, in chapter two. The promise is for you. These are the words that, this is part of Peter's sermon. Um, and so if you, if you weren't here last week and you say, I didn't have last week's notes, uh, they'll also give you last week's notes because we're going to finish up last week as, and then continue with this week as well. Amen. You can follow along if you want to. You can take notes. I encourage you to take notes as from being a school teacher and studying how to study for many, many years. I can tell you that when you do more than listen to something, you learn it better. When you're engaged in it, when you're involved in it, it sticks better. So um, you've, got the, you've got the notes and we continue this morning. Uh, if you'll take a quick look at the handout that you just received, take a look. We're, we're not going to start there, but we'll just look at it really quickly. Our key verse for today is from Acts 2, 38 and 39. So there we have on your page right there. So if anybody else wants one, they'll give one to you. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, there's our, there's our title, and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So that's our key passage uh, in this section. You'll notice that in this section we're going to look at today, there's another first. There's going to be the first public witness, as Jesus said. Uh, remember what Jesus said? He said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. And today, for the first time in this passage, we see that come to pass. Uh, you'll look at your definitions as well all who are far off and crooked generation and then you've got your references that come next we'll look at, you can look at that later and then you'll be looking ahead that's for what comes up next week uh, but we will continue if you have last week's what can this mean we'll finish up with last week's before we continue with the passage to, with the uh, passage today so we go back to that we were talking last week about the gift of the holy spirit that jesus promised and God gave, amen, on that feast day of the Jews. Remember with me what that day was like. It was a day of great religious tradition. It was a day of great ritual. It was something that these pious Jews had done for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, just the same. They had gone with their two loaves because it was a, it was a, a harvest festival. They went with their two loaves to the temple and they offered their two loaves as an offering to the Lord, thanking Him for the harvest, the end of the wheat, har the end of the barley harvest, the beginning of the wheat harvest. And in the middle of all of that religious tradition, what does God do? God interrupts ritual with His reality. You know, ritual many times is part of church. Ritual many times is part of our religious activity. But we must never let ritual take the place of reality in our lives. God is real. What He does is real. And it's living. And it gives life. And it brings life. And it brings hope. And God interrupts ritual with reality as He pours out His Holy Spirit. He's finished with the law that they have followed for more than a thousand years. And his, the time of the Spirit has come and the time of grace has come. Let's look at the next slide. What happens? He pours out His Holy Spirit and Jews come running from every nation who are in Jerusalem for the festival. And we talked last time about God's perfect timing. What time does it happen? Exact time. What time? Nine, Nine in the morning. Why is that important? It's the time of the morning sacrifice. 
at the temple. And so everybody is not in their homes drinking their morning coffee and having their morning bread. They are on the way to the temple or they're, they're walking in the streets towards the temple. So there are a lot of people around. And God chooses just the right time because he wants to know he's doing something different. He wants people to know he's doing something real. And that the times, the times of the past, their past, and that he's doing something new in their lives. And so he pours out his Holy Spirit, and we look at, uh, we, we talked about this last time, they hear their own language. Luke, when he writes this, is very, very specific. He says three times their own language. We hear them speaking in our own language. These people are speaking in our own languages. And remember, I gave you the example last week of my own grandfather who spoke German. True story. You can't ask him anymore because Grandpa's dead now. He's in heaven. Um, but true story uh, of hearing a man who had never learned German, could not speak German, wasn't even educated, begin to speak in German and praise the Lord. And my grandfather understood understood perfectly because he was a, because he spoke German. And then I, we told, I told you very briefly uh, the story of B. This is from our own church, B. Moody at Tagaytay. Her dad praising the Lord in another language. And dad didn't know what he was saying, but B understood perfectly. And then I told you the story of Brian, the Canadian businessman who had gone into that, to that village, a remote village, and God gave him the language of the village for the two days that he was there. And some of us say, how can this be? This is impossible. You're making this up. You're telling tales, Pastor Jennifer. God is a great God. God can do anything. And God does more wonderful things even than this. And this is truly amazing. And it is amazing. As we go through it, we talked about it before, they are bewildered. They're completely amazed, and here they are amazed and perplexed. It blows their minds. It goes beyond what they can understand. Has God ever done that in your life before? Yes, He's done that in my life. God, how can you do that? How can that be? But God can do that, and God does that in this particular situation. Okay, there are two... Resp uh, and uh, Let's see. Let me back... Uh, let me back up just a little bit. I was thinking about this as I was preparing. Did you look on your maps? That was one of your homework assignments um, to take these 15 places and see if you could find them on your maps. Don't do it now if you didn't do it last week. <laughs> you can do it later. But they say Luke writes in ev from every nation living in Jerusalem. Were there more nations than this? Of course there were. Of course there were. China's not listed there anywhere. And we know China was a nation at that time and other nations as well. But in the world, in their world, all, every nation, they were living there. But I want you to notice something here. Notice that they say, here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and so on. And then they say Judea. And to me that's interesting because you know what? Judea, if people were from Judea, everybody would understand what they were saying. That wasn't a different language. They would have understood what was being spoken in Judea. That was the area around Jerusalem. So what does that mean there? Remember we talked about this last week. The group is from Galilee. And because they were from Galilee, they had a special dialect. But not only did they have a special dialect, they had an accent, a strong accent that was very difficult to understand. Now, I gave you my example last week of being a southerner from the U.S., but you know I've been out of the U.S. for a long time. But if you were to talk to DJ this morning, who's only been out of the U.S. about a year or so, or something like that. DJ has a pretty strong accent, right? He's a southerner, okay? And you can hear his accent, but you can hear, you can understand completely what DJ says. But I was thinking about this. Um, they, there were visitors from Judea, and remember that the Galilean accent was not only strong, it was hard to understand. People had a very hard time. They'd listen and they couldn't understand what was being said. They couldn't understand the clear meaning. And as I was preparing yesterday, I was reminded of something that happened in Singapore many, many years ago. This is just one story today and then we'll go, we will go on. But I, I love telling stories of God's goodness and God's miraculous power. In the church in Singapore, it was when I was, it probably would, I think it would have been before I was born. My sister would have been born at that time. I still remember the story that mom and dad told. The church in Singapore was Cantonese and English speaking. And God began to move in the church. This was in the 50s. And 
God began to move in the church, and there were a lot of young people in the church. And in the church was a young, was an English-speaking young person. He spoke Cantonese and English as well. But this young man had a speech impediment. I don't know if you've ever talked to somebody who has a speech impediment before. Sometimes it's very difficult to understand. I mean, it wasn't just an accent like DJ and I have, and maybe Lauren just a little bit. It wasn't an accent, but it was something that made his speech very, di very, very difficult to understand. And people would, sp you would speak with him, but it was hard to understand. And because of that, he was also very, very shy because his pe people, people as a child, they made fun of him, and he was very difficult, difficult to understand. And so he seldom spoke. And one Sunday morning, God was moving in the service, and the Holy Spirit was poured out in the service and people were praising the Lord in many languages and mom and dad said suddenly they heard a man praying loudly with the help of the Holy Spirit boldly with confidence and with conviction and it was a voice they didn't recognize and they thought who is this the church wasn't large maybe about a hundred people or so and there were a lot of young people and they didn't recognize the voice they thought who is this person that's praying and praising the Lord and so they turned around because you know they're the pastors so they turned around to see who it was and it was this young man Bo Yip was his na is his name. He's still alive. He's still in Singapore. You could ask him. His name was Bo Yip. And he was standing there praising the Lord in perfect language. No speech impediment. No difficulty in understanding. No shyness. No, no hesitancy to communicate. Why? Because the Holy Spirit enabled him. The Holy Spirit enabled him. And that's a perfect example, uh, that's a perfect modern day example, <coughs> excuse me, of what we read here that happened 2,000 years ago. And the Holy Spirit enabled Bo Yip to speak and to pray and to praise the Lord in perfectly understood languages. No difficulty, no lisp, nothing at all. And that is what the Holy Spirit does, brothers and sisters. When the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, when He comes into our situations, He does what we cannot do because He's God. Because He's God. And that's what happened here. Now, here's this incredible thing that happens. Everybody is gathered and there are two responses. And you know what? There are usually two responses to the true work and the true moving of God. What is one of the responses? One of the responses is this. What can this mean? In other words, I don't understand it. These people were sincere. They couldn't figure this out. How can a bunch of uneducated people from Galilee be doing this? We don't understand. What can this mean? What can this mean? But as you know, when God is moving and working, that's usually not the only response, isn't it? There's another response. Of course, there's the response of, yes, God, this is you and I accept. But there was another response as well. And what, does, what is the next response? Next slide. But there were others in the crowd who ridiculed them. And what did they say? They're drunk. Okay? They're drunk. That tells you a little bit, perhaps, about what was going on and how things were, how things were looking. Now, I have a question. I am not the smartest person in the world, but I'm not the dumbest person in the world either. And to me, it seems pretty illogical, doesn't it to you, that being drunk would somehow help a group of uneducated people suddenly, perfectly speak all of these languages. Do you think drunkenness would somehow do that? Is that an effect of drunkenness? Absolutely not. So it's a pretty, to me, it's a pretty lame criticism. It's a pretty lame mockery, but they have no other answer for it. They must be drunk. They must be drunk. And so that's one of the responses. May I say something to you this morning, brothers and sisters, in your own life, when God is moving and working and it's really God, you will often find those responses of people to what's going on in your life. There will be people who will praise God for what's happening in your life and they'll say, this is the work of God in your life. I see what God is doing. Guess what? There will be plenty other people who will mock your change and your life. Have you found that to be true? 
They will question what's going on. They will, they will make up some excuse. Oh, you've just, you know what people sometimes say? Oh, you've got religion now. Religion can't change anybody's life, can't it? Only God can change people's lives. But you will often find this response. So I want to tell you something right now. When that's the response you get in your life, when God is doing something and there's a change in your life, don't let it discourage you. Don't let it turn you back. Don't let it turn you away. You keep on going with God. Because if it happened then, 2,000 years ago, to a wonderful thing that God had done, it still happens today as well, right? And most of us, if not all of us, have been ridiculed at some point. You know, years ago, uh, when Tom first became a Christian, Tom, wave your hand, there you go, right back there. His friend, Big Steve, who will be in the second service, by the way, Karen, Tom's British, Karen, and you know you got to be careful about religion, right? Tom became a Christian first, and Steve and others had plenty to say about the change in his life, didn't they? <laughs> Tom wants to be polite, so he's just smiling. <laughs> And your family. That's right. And it's often people that are the closest to us. What's going on? What's wrong with you? Why have you changed? Brothers and sisters, you hold on to what God has done in your life. And you keep on going with it. And you stay with it. And you walk with God. And don't let the ridicule and the mockery of other people turn you back from the great things that God is doing in your life. Those of you who are young people this morning, right now, young people, it's just David and Joshua. But David and Joshua, I'll tell you right now, if you follow God, and as God changes your life, when you're in school, there'll be plenty of room classmates who will look at you and kind of make fun of what you do or what you don't do. But the work of God is real in our lives, and we keep on going. Amen? Amen. What if, brothers and sisters, what if 2,000 years ago the mockery of the people had turned this whole crowd, oh, we better not do this anymore, we better not say this anymore. You and I wouldn't be sitting here this morning because out of this they went out into the world and gave the message of the good news of Jesus to the world. And that's why you and I are here today. And so we see this. So here are these two responses. So let's see what happens next. Peter takes this opportunity when they say, oh, they're just drunk, and he begins to preach. Do you know what, what people say to you? We, you know, we sometimes have, you know, when we want to share Jesus with people, we sometimes have our list of things already. I'm, I'm going to share Jesus with somebody today. Okay, this is what I'm going to say. I encourage you, be prepared, but I encourage you even more, be led by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will open doors and provide opportunities for you to share God's love and God's truth. And Peter uses this opportunity. They mock them and say, they're drunk. And Peter stands up and he uses the, you're drunk, to say, brothers, of, brothers, fellow Jews, listen carefully. We are not drunk. Don't make a mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. And so he begins his sermon based on what they've said. And brothers and sisters, a lot of times when we, if we will be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, he'll give us opportunities based on what people say. And we can respond to that. And so Peter gets up and he begins to preach. And he makes the very logical case that drunkenness is not the cause of what has just happened. So what is Peter's explanation for what's happened? Let's see what comes next. He says, no, we're not drunk. Verses 16, 17, and 18, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. Here's the prophecy. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. May I tell you why I've chosen this as our key verse for this passage? Because what is said here in these three verses for them was revolutionary. It was completely revolutionary. We're used to this at this point. But for the Jews who were listening, this was amazing. Amazing. 
God didn't pour out His Spirit on ordinary people. And by the way, we sometimes feel that way too, don't we? God speaks to special people. God will talk to Pastor Renee. God will, will talk to Pastor Jennifer and maybe to, you know, Sister Ida because she's a Bible teacher. But God talks to them, but not, not to me because I'm just an ordinary person. But the time of God and the times of the Holy Spirit, God changes everything. And for that crowd listening, to hear that God would give His Spirit and would pour out His Spirit on everyone was almost too hard to believe that God would put His Spirit on women and not just on men was absolutely, excuse me, was absolutely incredible because, you know, women in the whole order of things, sorry, women, women were way at the bottom of the totem pole. They were. In fact, there were certain areas that women couldn't even go into in the temple. There was the court of the women, and that's as far as they could go. The men could go in further. But not only that, then you had to be special and you had to be this and you had to be that. And Peter says the times of the, the prophet that the prophet Joel prophesied about have come. These are the last days, and I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. I hope that encourages you this morning. It certainly encourages me. Brothers and sisters, this is what God was saying to them and what God is saying to us. God makes no differentiation. Are you uneducated this morning? Guess what? God chose to pour out His Spirit first on a group of uneducated Galileans. Are you highly educated this morning? Guess what? Later on, God chose Saul, who later was named Paul, to take his gospel to the Gentiles. That's God. Are you very religious this morning? God pours out His Spirit on you. Do you say, I'm a brand new Christian, I'm a baby Christian? Guess what? God pours out His Spirit on you as well. Are you rich? Are you poor? God makes no differentiation. Verse 18, in those days I will pour out my Spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And when it says prophesy, that has to do with the work of the Holy Spirit and prayer and the Holy Spirit in their lives. And so for them and for the people listening, this was something completely new. It was something that was hard for them to understand. Are you His servant this morning? Yes or no? Yes. If you are, then receive the promise fulfilled. Receive the prophecy fulfilled. Some of you say, this is not for me. This is just for the special ones, for the really spiritual ones, for the really religious ones, for that denomination. That's not what God says, brothers and sisters. What God says is, I will pour out, it's said twice, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. I will pour out my spirit even on my servants. This is the promise of God. So this is what it means. So when the people say, what does this mean? What can this mean? The first thing is that God says, I make no difference between people. I will pour out my spirit on all, on all flesh, on everyone. What else does this mean? It means, according to Peter, that we are living in the last days. Look at verse 17. Peter writes, in the last days got of the prophecy that, that, um, that Joel uh, records, in the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit upon all people. And this is a part we don't like to talk about very much, but this is part of it as well. So the pouring out of the spirit began the last days. Now we talk about the last days and what do we think of? It's the last days. Jesus is coming soon. The Antichrist, tribulation. We think of all those things. But brothers and sisters, in fact, according to what the Bible says, the pouring out of the Spirit 2,000 years ago began a period called the last days. You say, well, that's really a long time to be the last days. Well, don't argue with me. You talk to God about that. That's what God says, okay? The last days. So what else does it mean? Let's look at the next passage that comes. And this is something else that it means. This is something that we need to understand as well. Then he continues the prophecy. Peter is quoting what Joel says and what else is included in that prophecy. I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark, the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. Then verse 21, but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
May I say something this morning? Just as surely as you and I this morning accept and believe the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh, that's the wonderful part, that's the joyful part, there is another part to the last days, and that's in these verses. And just as surely as God kept His Word for pouring out His Spirit upon all flesh, part of the last days will include a time when finally the judgment of God falls on those who have said, God, I don't want you. God, you're not my God. God, you're not the Lord of my life. I do my own thing. I live my own way. I want nothing to do with you. And one day there will come the judgment of God. But brothers and sisters, even in the midst of that judgment, look at verse 21. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God is a merciful God. God is a loving God. God is a gracious God. And so brothers and sisters, because the last days include not only the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, but because the last days also include a time of judgment, you and I must go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's part of it. That's part of it. And even in the midst of difficulty, even in the midst of judgment, God offers mercy, God offers grace, and God pours out His love. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I don't know about you, but I've thought about this before. If I were God, aren't you glad we're not God? If I were God, I don't know if I could say verse 21. Because I look at this world, and to me, there are some people that are so awful. We look at history. We look back in history at terrible people, at terrible leaders, and the awful things that we've done. And you and I say, they're not worth being saved. They deserve only judgment. They don't deserve mercy. They don't deserve grace. They don't deserve love. But that's why God is God. And He says, everyone who calls on my name will be saved, will be saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, Peter begins to preach, and let's look at what comes next. He begins to preach, but guess what? You sometimes think Pastor Anna and I preach a long time. Guess what? Peter preached a really, really, really long time. In fact, a little bit later in this passage, uh, we get the excerpts in 26 verses. Let's go to the next slide. We get excerpts in 26 verses, but P the Bible says that Peter preached a long time. I don't know how long he preached. We know that Paul preached long enough that somebody fell out of the window and fell down to the ground because he preached all night long. We haven't had that happen at Lighthouse, although sometimes people fall asleep but Peter begins to preach <laughs> it's true right hey br by the way brothers and sisters do you know that the pastors always know when you're sleeping did you know that yeah. we always know you think we don't you know because there are a lot of people in lighthouse and you're all said everybody everybody's awake now <laughs> some of you just went <laughs> it just went like that. Pastor Renee and I were talking about it. It's true. It's the pastor's eyes. We know when and we can be. We know when somebody's sleeping. We know when somebody's checking YouTube or their Facebook message during the during the service. Pastors know these things. Back to the Word of God. <laughs> I've got you awake again, right? So Peter begins to preach. It's 26 verses, and that's short because he actually preaches a lot longer. So we're going to look just briefly um, and very shortly at just a few of the things that Peter talks about that are important for us this morning. So if you're looking, we're still on the, we're still on the old part. Peter gives an introduction and he says, uh, he says these, this is a prophecy, these are the last days. And then he begins because he's preaching to people who do not believe in Jesus. He's preaching to people that are waiting for a Messiah still to come. So we got to keep in mind why Peter's preaching what he's preaching. So what's the first thing, what's the first point he makes? First of all, he says, listen, God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. Now, why does Peter begin this way? Because Peter's going to reach the point at the end of his sermon that, well, even before the end of his sermon, number one, that Jesus is alive, 
that Jesus is the one is the Messiah, that Jesus is God, and finally that they killed him. That's where he's going to reach. And so he wants them to understand very clearly he's going to get from where he is all the way to the end. And so he's going to give them four proofs that Jesus is still alive, that he has resurrected, and that he's the Son of God. So what's the first proof he gives them? And by the way, I'm really compressing this. There's much more than this. What's the first thing he does to show, to tell them that Jesus is of God and that Jesus has been raised from the dead? He says, first of all, he uses the life of Jesus. The first proof was the life of Jesus and his mighty deeds to support the resurrection that Jesus could not have done that without being of God and born of God. Uh, and it says, but God knew what would happen and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to the cross. Guess what, brothers and sisters? This sermon would not be popular. I don't know about your country. I can tell you about America. This sermon would not be popular in America today. Nobody wants to hear anything that strong. Nobody wants to hear anything that convicting. You killed Jesus. You killed Jesus. But that's exactly what Peter says. Because if they're going to know what truth is, they've got to hear this. If they're going to repent, they've got to understand what they've done. If they're going to turn around, which is part of repentance, they've got to know the way they've been going and the way they've got to go. And so Peter doesn't beat around the bush. He says, you nailed him to the cross with the help of lawless Gentiles. But he says to them, the first proof was the life of Jesus and his mighty deeds. And then the second proof is the prophecy of David from the Psalms, all the way back in the Psalms, verse, 27, uh, verse 25, for King David said this about him, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. Now, how many of you have been to Israel before? A few of us have, right? Maybe two of us have. I don't know about you, but when I went to Israel and when I was in Jerusalem, I looked around and I did not see David's tomb anywhere. Did you? Nope. We didn't see David's tomb. But this tells us something. When this sermon was preached, at that time, David's tomb was still there and all of the, all of the Jews would have known this is where David, our greatest king, is buried. They would have known that at that time. That's why he preaches, uh, and you'll have to say, but where is that? You've got to read your Bibles for more of that. You look at verses 26, 28, and 29. Because Peter says, David is lying here still among us today, as you all know, as you know very well. But David gives us prophecy. And so Peter makes the very logical argument. It couldn't have been, P it couldn't have been David. This is a prophecy about Jesus. You know what encourages me? Peter was not, was not, as we say, the brightest bulb in the box. Do you know what that means? He wasn't particularly educated or smart or logical. But when you look at this sermon that Peter preaches, it's a great sermon. It's incredible. It's so well put together. It's so logical. It's much more logical than Peter ever was when you get to know his life. But this is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit takes you where you are. The Holy Spirit takes what you are and who you are as you come to the Lord and give yourself to Him. And the Holy Spirit does something incredible in your life. He makes a change. He makes a difference. He transforms you and He transforms me. And so here's the second point. He says, this prophecy is not about David. See, his tomb is right here. And I think it's possible that Peter may even have pointed in the direction of the tomb of David. Probably. It's here, or it's here, or, it, or it's here. And so everybody would have thought, well, that's true. We, we honor David as our greatest king, and here he is. His tomb is right here. So it wasn't about David. So the second proof that he gives is the prophecy that this is about Jesus. Okay? And then we go a little bit further. What comes next? Let's look at the next one. We go a little bit further, and then he comes 
to verses 32 and 33, and here we have the third proof and the fourth proof. This is the gospel message. This is the gospel message. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Remember what Jesus said? We talked about this at the very beginning. Jesus said to them, when the Holy Spirit's poured out on you, you will be my witness. Guess what, brothers and sisters? Here in verse 32 is the fulfillment of the words of Jesus. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit's poured on you, you will become my witnesses. And for the first time, for the first time, that happens. They stand publicly. And this lets us know about the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. Because remember the old Peter? The old Peter, first of all, cut off somebody's ear and then ran away and then denied Jesus. But the new Peter, transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, the new Peter, the new Peter can stand and say, I am a witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, some of us this morning, and plenty of people would say, yeah, but Pastor Jennifer, anybody could say, I've seen Jesus alive. Anybody could say, I'm a witness of Jesus. But I want you to think with me for just a minute. For Peter and for the other disciples to say this, it was the stupidest thing that they could say to the crowd. It was the most illogical thing they could say to the crowd. This was not a popular message. This was not something that would gain them any friends. This was not something that would make them stand up in the community because this was something that would bring down the judgment of all of the priest system and would bring down the judgment of the Romans as well. This was not something popular. And Peter stands up with the other disciples and he says, we're witnesses of Jesus. We're witnesses of Jesus. And that in itself is a support and a proof that what they're saying, it's true that they've seen. And so there's the third proof. He says, we are witnesses of that. That's proof number three. But he doesn't stop there. How does he end? And he ends with verse, well, he doesn't end with verse 33. He keeps on talking, but he ends with the four proofs. He says, now he's exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us just as you see and hear today. And here's the, here's the great part about this fulfillment and this proof. For the disciples... They understood. Jesus said, when I go back to heaven, I will ask the Father and He will give the Holy Spirit. And so for the disciples, do you know what this told them with great joy? They confirmed and they knew Jesus has gone back to heaven. He's with the Father and He did exactly what He said He would do. He has poured out the Holy Spirit. And so they use that as the fourth proof. And they say, this is the confirmation, this is proof that Jesus has been raised from the dead as He promised. Remember Proverbs 30 verse 5? What does Proverbs 30 verse 5 say? God <laughs> God keeps Every promise He makes. That's right. Proverbs 30, verse 5. God keeps every promise He makes. Hallelujah. And so He says the Father, he's, he's just as He promised, He gave the Holy Spirit. Now, this is so great. And wouldn't you like to stop right here? This is a high point, isn't it? Wouldn't you like to stop right there? Yay! God has given the Holy Spirit. Jesus is back in heaven. But Peter doesn't stop there because Peter's purpose is not just to say Jesus is back in heaven and Jesus is raised from the dead. The purpose, Peter's purpose, is to reach them with the same truth that they too would respond. And so he doesn't stop there. Let's go a little bit further. Look at the next slide. What does he, he keeps on preaching? Oh, what a bummer. <laughs> Oh, what a bummer. He comes to verse 36 and he says, So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. <gasps> That's kind of a downer, isn't it? To come to this point. He says, So you should know Jesus, the one you crucified, he's Lord and Messiah. Why does Peter use both phrases, Lord and Messiah? Messiah, we understand, right? Messiah was one sent from God. That's what it means, anointed and sent from God. 
Messiah for the Jews was the one they were all waiting for. They were all waiting for the Messiah that would come from God. So that's the part of it. And the other part of it, when Peter says, He has made him both Lord, let the people know He is God Himself. He's not just one sent from God. He's God Himself. And so this is what he says. What is the response that the people give as they hear that? Look at verse 37. Peter's words pierce their hearts. But you know what? Was it Peter that pierced their hearts? Was it what Peter had done that pierced their hearts? Peter's not that smart. <coughs> Peter's not that eloquent. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Remember what Jesus said? When the Holy Spirit comes, He will convict of sin. That's what He does. Do you remember when you first turned to the Lord? Do you remember what was going on in your heart? the conviction and the heavy feeling of guilt and you thought if I don't if I don't come to God if I don't do something about this I'll die I can't I can't stand it that was the work of the Holy Spirit that was the work of the Holy Spirit in drawing you to God and so Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said to him and to the other apostles brothers what should we do why do they say this why do they say this brothers what should we do do you think they're asking, how can we get saved? I don't think that's what they're asking. Do you know what I think they're asking? Do you know what I think they mean? They have just heard that the Messiah, their only hope, the one they've been waiting for, the one they've put all of their hopes and dreams in, the one that will save them, the one that will save Israel, they've killed him. They've rejected him. They didn't want him. He's gone back to heaven. What hope do they have? What help do they have? He was the one. He's alive now, but we rejected him. We killed him on the cross. And so their response is, what can we do? In other words, we are without hope. We have no hope now. We've rejected our only hope. We've rejected our only chance. We've killed the one that God sent. And so their response is, what should we do? In effect, there's nothing we can do. What can be done? And oh, I love what comes next. I love what comes next because Peter says next. Let's look at the next part. They're going to for the first time. They've only known the law. And now they're going to meet amazing grace. Amazing grace. And Peter says to them, and Peter says to us this morning, he says what? Repent, be baptized, every one of you. You mean even those that said, crucify Jesus. Even those that spat upon him. Even those that mocked him as he carried the cross to Calvary. Even those people have a chance for grace. Even those people have a chance for hope a chance for God's mercy, and a chance for God's love, Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Oh, brothers and sisters, how amazing is the grace of God. How amazing is the grace of God. I cannot accept a world that says God's hard, God's mean, God's judgmental. They haven't met this God. And that's why they need to meet this God. He says, repent every one of you. There's hope for everyone. There's grace for everyone. There's love for everyone. There's mercy for everyone. For every person who has rejected God, there's still love, there's still grace, there's still mercy. For those who have spat upon Him and mocked Him and ridiculed Jesus in the name of the Lord, there's hope, there's grace, there's mercy. That's what Peter says, because it's no longer the time of law. It's the time of the Spirit of God and the time of grace. There is forgiveness for sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Peter ends by saying, look at the next part, the promises for you 
and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Are you in the Bible? I am. Guess where I am? Where are you, DJ? Right there. Are you right there? For all who are far off. The gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, you're in the Bible. All the way back then, 2,000 years ago, the mercy of God and the grace of God and the love of God was poured out for all who are far off. That's you and me this morning. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you that you will pour out your Spirit on all flesh. We thank you that every one of us can repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus and have our sins forgiven as you turn our lives around and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and that your promise was for them and for their children, but that your promise is for us as well. Lord, may we receive the promise that you have given us. May we receive all that you have for us. We thank you so much that we don't live under law or guilt or condemnation, but we live with your grace and your love and your hope in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.